Jason Barrett joins us now. Good morning, sir. How are you? Hey, good morning. And uh, it's awfully cold here in Charleston as well. But, Bill, I just want to make sure you're aware that even though it's this cold, the Yellow Jacket Queen is still buried and hibernating underground. So <laughs> they'll be back again next year. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. At least I have three or four months I can sleep in peace. And she's angry. <laughs> and she is angry. <laughs> cold and bitter, Bill. Cold and bitter. <laughs> Thinking of all those that was dis- all of her buddies that were dispatched last year. Mm-hmm. She's going to come, uh, come back with a vengeance this coming year. Hey, Jason, thanks a lot for bringing that up. Yes. Anything for you, Bill. <laughs> we had forgotten about that bee suit, which was not quite sealed as you found no, out right uh, jason sounds like you got a cold is the capitol hill crud going around a lot already uh, a little bit yeah i um um i haven't had it as bad as as most of the folks um i'm not going to suggest it's tiger blood or anything like that i think i'm just fortunate that i have a little congestion but other than that i'm i'm in pretty good shape all right very good so uh we've got uh governor justice coming on the uh, show later on uh, this morning, it's the last year for the governor's term and an election year for everybody in the House of Delegates, uh, for instance. You don't have to deal with that now as a senator on a four year term. Do you anticipate that creating any additional issues as this is the final year of the governor's term, Jason? You know, the, I mean, this governor is, is operated very differently than um, any other governor that the, the other governor that I serve with. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I I don't think it, it creates any problems. I mean, we, we all have been come accustomed to, to working with Governor Justice and the way in which he operates. And, you know, this is the, the final year of that. We'll get through it the way we always do. And it's, it's obviously helpful that we have um, record surpluses, that we've been able to agree to the largest tax cut in state history. So, um, I think we'll work through it. There are going to be differences the way there there always is. There will be differences between the House and the Senate. There will be differences between the uh, the governor's office and, and uh, each body of the legislature. So we'll get through it. It won't be a big deal. The state Senate yesterday took up and unanimously adopted SCR 17, reaffirming support of West Virginia legislature for state of Israel and Jewish people. Uh, can you tell me why you folks felt that was necessary to do, Jason? Well, that was something that um, Senator Woodrum introduced. Um, I think there's there's overwhelming support of that in the legislature and in across West Virginia. Uh, we've received um, a lot of emails um, regarding the issue and support. And um, you know, I think that that Senator Woodrum, who, who serves as the chair of a government organization, as you know, I'm the vice chair. So mm-hmm. so Jack and I are, uh, work together really well. And uh, Jack felt it was something important, as, as did the caucus and. Um, So we we pass resolutions um, similar to those type of things um, usually every year um, in support of of one cause or another or to call on Congress to to do something or or not do something. So uh, those type of resolutions are fairly common. Jason, do the uh, the resolutions require uh, governor's signature? Not that I'm aware of, no. No, they, 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 they don't. I'm, I'm fairly confident in that, Bill. I, you kind of caught me off guard. It's yeah. not something I thought about. Before, no, I think, I, that, I think you're exactly right. I do not think they, they're not an official bill. They're just a statement of, of interest or yep. concern. And I don't think you even have to uh, have it passed by the House for it to stand either. Well, it, de- de- it depends on the type of resolution. Yeah. If it's a joint resolution, then yes. yes. This is a Senate concurrent resolution, so, so you're right. The only, the only body that would act on that resolution is the Senate. In and of itself, it's it doesn't bind you to anything. It's just basically a statement of support, right. correct? That's right. All right. Uh, Jason, tell me about some of the uh, bills that you'll be working on this session and uh, some of the progress of some of the things that you introduced last year that uh, you're hoping get traction this year and some new things for this year. Sure. Well, today is day eight, so it's, um, you know, we're not uh, – deep into it yet. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we're still working on legislation, still getting things moving. The Judiciary Committee that, as you know, I serve on this year, we've been dealing with some rules bundles, which are pages and pages and pages and pages of, of, of different various rules based on that the agency has come up with, the Rules Committee has vetted, and now they go through the Judiciary Committee, um, rules that are created based on legislation that we passed last year. So um, I've been spending a lot of time going through those for a few different agencies. We have one today in Judiciary dealing with the, the Revenue Department. Uh, I am working to update the locality pay bill that passed the Senate last year, passed House Finance Committee and was parked in their uh, Rules Committee because it was a little controversial that there was 
a food fight in the house over over locality pay on a couple different instances last year. Uh, I think this year I'm going to pull out all there, there were essentially legislative findings in it, and the findings were centered around the housing uh, differential. Um, you know what a house what housing costs in the Eastern Panhandle versus what housing costs in the rest of the state. Uh, but the bill actually talked more about market rate, uh, not comparing housing, but comparing what the rate, the market rate for employment um, in similar sectors uh, in the Eastern Panhandle, whether that would be um, the private sector. So if you had a job working for the state government and you took a job uh, in the private sector, uh, there's obviously a difference to that, but but also if you worked for the government in the Eastern Panhandle for the state of West Virginia, and then you went to work for the state of Maryland and Virginia. So it was really about giving flexibility to state agencies uh, where they had shortages due to uh, the market rate of surrounding areas or or public or private sector industry um, kind of in the same field. So uh, it was given flexibility to those agencies to create a plan to come back to the legislature as to how they were going to implement some form of locality pay, uh, again, based on market rate conditions, not based on the cost of housing. We, I think we've tried that housing aspect for a number of years. Uh, we haven't been able to get it across the finish line, so that's why I took the different approach. Uh, with the market rate, but it still had those legislative findings in there about the housing, and that caused a little bit of an issue. And so I'm going to take that out this year. Is that five percent? So I'm working on. Is that five percent pay raise for state employees? Uh, I don't want to say a done deal, but a pretty sure thing. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's not something that that I've had a lot of conversations about. I think there is certainly uh, support to do that. Uh, but as we spoke last week, the governor has over $744 million in spending uh, above last year. Um, so we're, our, our job as is, is stewards of taxpayer funds is to, is to make sure we spend money in the most, uh, taxpayer money in the most appropriate way. Um, so that's something that, that will be vetted throughout the House and the Senate, and we'll figure out um, you know, if that's, that's the right thing to do. Jason, last year there was a lot of energy and attention given to corrections. Uh, do you think you've reached the point that you can uh, work on last year's activity, or, or will you pursue corrections again this year? Well, I, I think there's still work to be done. I, uh, as you know, the, the, the committee that I chair uh, in the interims, are uh, in that, that committee has done a, a lot of oversight work working with um, – uh, Commissioner Marshall, who is the, the commissioner of, of uh, DCR. And, uh, you know, I, I've been impressed with him th this far. You know, we've given him suggestions. We've passed bills in, in um, special session. Uh, he's implemented those those things. And, and, you know, I think that we're on the right track. There, there's still certainly work to be done. Um, as you recall, one of the things that we did in the um, in special session was to give that pay raise uh, to uniformed officers. There's also support uh, by, by some members of the legislature and, and I believe the governor to give additional pay raises to non-uniformed officers or non-uniformed employees uh, within the within corrections. So, you know, I think all of these state pay raises are, are and, and I don't mean to downplay it in, in the previous question because I think there is a lot of support and, you know, I've always supported pay raises to, to state employees. I, I think it's just a little premature right now to say, one of the governor's proposals is a done deal or, or dead on arrival. I think it's just a little premature to do that. So that's that's why I was somewhat cautious when talking about the pay rates. There's been a proposal. This is John, Jason. Good morning. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, there's a proposal out there to eliminate taxes on Social Security payments across the board. Right now, it's it's geared toward what under fifty thousand dollars for single and a hundred thousand dollars for for married couple. And the proposal is out there to eliminate state income tax on Social Security payments. Where do you stand on that, and what is the likelihood of that going through? Well, generally speaking, I support of reducing personal income tax whether it's on Social Security or uh, anyone else's personal income tax. Uh, the, the, the cost to do it for those that, that make in excess of 50000 a year or those that, or couples that make in excess of $100,000, uh, what we've been told is the cost of that is $37 million. And um, while I support you know, eliminating the tax on, 
on Social Security in its entirety, we have to be cautious about doing targeted tax cuts uh, because the more you do targeted tax cuts and you and you say, okay, we're going to reduce or eliminate taxes for this group or that group, then it makes it harder to get to the point where we're trying to get where we're doing it for everyone. And, and you know, there is a 21 and a quarter percent personal income tax reduction uh, for every for everyone last year, and and that includes those that were making above fifty or couples that made more than a hundred thousand dollars on their social security. So, um, that I have some reservation about doing targeted tax cuts like that. Uh, when I think it would just make more sense to do a larger reduction in personal income tax across the board. Taxing uh, and tar- targeted tax cuts make that a little bit harder. Taxing social security to me is like getting a tax refund from the state and then the state taxing you on your tax refund the next year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not supportive of taxing social security. I want to make that very clear. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what is the best thing as for the state as a whole, what is the best thing for, for taxpayers in general? Um, You know, if there's a way to do it, I'm not saying that I'm not going to support it. I just want to make sure that doing that doesn't, make it more difficult for personal in- for across the board personal income taxes to be right. able to afford those moving forward. It's one of the reasons why I've been told that they have not tackled the marriage penalty on state income tax because the goal is phase out the state income tax and then that takes care of the marriage penalty and all other inequities in the state income tax system. Just right, because it's completely eliminated for everybody, right. whether you're married, single, or on Social Security or not on Social Security. Mm-hmm. Now we had Ron Gregory on the show a few days ago, and when, <laughs> he was he was bringing it too, man. Yeah, Let he me was, tell you something. He, he was, was bringing it. He was in good form, <laughs> and and one of the concerns he expressed. I just want to run it past. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I didn't take the notes. Were not all that careful, but the essence is that West Virginia has been living off the largesse of windfalls between the um, opioid settlement and the COVID money, and while we've we've been feeling sort of fat and and wealthy. And and as a result, we have uh, windfall uh, excesses in, in we got we got to get great rainy day fund. We have all the uh, the tax returns of uh, reductions of taxes and what have you. But the, the piper is coming and he's going to call. And the, when we run out of windfall money, we're going to be uh, having special sessions to figure out how we have to raise taxes to get the money back. Do you have concerns about any of that? No. And I don't, and I listen to some of that and um, be honest with you, I just had to turn it off. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, we have been far more cautious about tax cuts, about spending. And, and that's why you, you see a lot of the things that we do with, with uh, uh, surplus and excess revenue. We, we, there's a lot of one-time spends in there. It's not base building. It's things that we can do uh, on an investment, from an investment standpoint, uh, to continue to boost West Virginia's economy, but not to do something base building where we're getting out uh, ahead of our skis. And, and that's why, you know, when we talked about the, the tax cut, whether we were going to do uh, eliminate the uh, equipment inventory, personal property tax, or we did the, the large personal income tax cut, you know, we, the natural growth in the economy, and I said this all, you, you know, last year and the year before, the, the natural growth in the in the West Virginia's economy is about in the budget is about 140 million dollars a year. We've had flatline budgets, so you know when you have several years of flatline budgets, you know where essentially you could be spending 140 million dollars extra a year and not get into any type of financial trouble because that's the natural na- natural growth. When you're able to not spend that money, that's money that you have to use in perpetuity for tax cuts and those type of things. So. Um, that's why we've been able to do tax cuts uh, and, and be able to be confident that we're not going to create a fiscal problem in the future. Now, if we would have, um, you know, had four years of flatline budgets, which, which again is about five hundred and sixty million dollars um, that that we could have spent but didn't, that's why we've done a tax cut that was very close to that. We would could have done a billion and a half dollar tax cut, then I'd say, yeah, there'd be problems because the natural growth in our uh, budget does, can't sustain a, that large of a tax cut. So we've been extremely mindful of, of what we're able to do, what the natural growth is, what we can afford and can't. So, you know, to say that all this is based on 
on uh, money from the federal government or COVID or anything else. That's just simply not true. There's been a lot of money because of that, uh, but that's not what's allowed us to do tax cuts, and and we are not putting ourselves in a situation to be um, the, the way Kansas turned out with their personal income tax cuts. Uh, we're we're taking a, a much more prudent approach, and uh, and and. So it's not a concern of mine. Um, I, I know Ron Gregory is trying to get attention. I understand that, but but it's not reality. Jason, let me change subjects. Uh, I understand you're putting the uh, putting the bill forward that would uh, limit easements, uh, land easements from land trust and uh, and uh, farmland protection to 25 years. Uh, at the 25 years, they would expire. Everybody that goes into these agreements uh, go into the fact they want to protect the land. They want to protect the land for in perpetuity. Uh, otherwise, they would not make an agreement. They could sell the land to develop a, a developer a lot and get more money than they do by going to land trust or farmland protection. If you limit it, to, if you, after 25 years you take the easement off, aren't you violating the agreement of these landowners that want to keep the land in some sort of pristine state? Well, I, I don't know that I'm putting a bill forward. I, I know that there are a few senators working on it. Um, I have an easement, so I have a little bit of, uh, uh, I have a, probably a better understanding than most members of the legislature. So I'm, I'm providing some assistance in my perspective. Um, certainly, I'm not trying to do anything that would affect my easement, but um, there is an example, and, and I mentioned Senator Woodrum earlier, and, and Senator Woodrum is one of them that is, um, you know, who, again, chairs the government work committee. We had a meeting on the Interim Government Organization Committee on last Sunday, the last day, well, the, the last couple days of interims, where we had folks from Farmland Protection, but we also had folks um, the one lady who serves on three Farmland Protection Boards, but is the um, head of the development authority for the Greenbrier Valley. And, and kind of what's driving a lot of this bill is that there are 600 acres right next to the Greenbrier Airport that really is the only piece of property that could be used for expansion of that airport. And, and Cleve Benedict, who is a former member of Congress and uh, former agriculture commissioner, I believe, is, is, uh, has put that in farmland protection uh, where that's used taxpayer money to put that 600 acres in farmland protection in perpetuity forever. Uh, I think forever um, is is dangerous, to be quite honest with you. Um, and, and the fact that there's no provision to stop a piece of land. So let, let's, for example, in Berkeley County, uh, where Procter & Gamble is, you know, it, it would have been perfectly legal for whoever that property owner was to put all that in farmland protection even though it's in a prime developable area and where industry should go, where jobs should go. Now, you have a piece of property that, you know, is somewhere else that, that, that shouldn't be, you know, it's not in an industrial area or in an area for uh, commercial business, then, then that's something different. But uh, I just think that protecting it for, and, you know, I think there's a difference between preservation and conservation. I just say, I think that, that you have an easement that, that is forever. We have no idea what any of this place is going to look like in 500 years or 1,000 years. And to say that, nope, you can't have any type of development there of any kind. You have no way to stop it right now if it's in an area that is probably not best suited um, you know, to, to, to render 100 acres or 500 acres uh, uh, to, to not be developed. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of parts in West Virginia that, that need some development, that need some industry. Uh, and, and for this 600 acres in Greenbrier County, I think is a huge mistake. And, and I think there are a lot of, of, of landowners and farmers that, you know, the idea is to protect farmland. And I'm all supportive of protecting farmland. But when you tell the, the property owner, okay, here's the amount of money, the farmer, that, that, that in some cases the farmers are taking this, this money from this conservation easement so they can continue on. Farming is not necessarily the most lucrative business. Um, but it's something that we absolutely need, need and, and need to help protect. Uh, and in some cases, these these farmers, you know, get cash from, um, you know, putting their property in farmland protection, and that's that they're able to then, you know, continue to farm for a number of years. But what happens in 25 or 30 years if they get into another predicament? Um, they don't have the ability to sell part of their 
farm off to be able to save the family farm. They either sell the whole thing or nothing. And I just think it makes more sense for farmers to be able and, and property owners to be able to say, you know what, I'm willing to, for the next 25 years, to put this property in a conservation easement. I can continue to farm it. And in 25 years, uh, if my family decides we want to continue that, then you can renew the 25-year uh, easement again. If you say that's not in the best interest of my family or m- my family's farm, then then we're going to make a different decision. And um, I think it's, it's, it expands the property rights for the individual. Uh, if somebody still owns, a, if somebody owns a farm or owns a large piece of property and they want to put deed restrictions on the property, they're entitled to do that. And, and that's their right. And I'm in no way trying to take that right for them. But when we're taking pieces of land across this state that have uh, that, that could be developed and should be developed in the future for future industry and bringing jobs and growing our state's economy, uh, to take taxpayer money for that and give it to some to somebody that just simply doesn't want that land ever developed, um, I think is not the best use of taxpayer money. And on that um, note, Jason, not- you've got to get to your caucus. I appreciate your time this morning, and I thank you very much. If there's anything else you needed to add to that, now's the time to do it before you go. No, that was, sorry, I didn't mean to filibuster you, Bill. Yeah, we this this uh, developed a lot of strong feelings among several groups. I'm sure we'll be hearing a great deal more about this in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Guys. All right, the Senate caucuses at eight thirty each morning, so they uh, have a pretty strong deadline for that. There.